see Dame Zandra Rhodes. Firstly, you are the first dame that I've ever spoken to, so Oh, thank I can't you. believe that. It's very true. <laughs> and also, you are the embodiment of my favourite word in the world, which is the word queen. You are a pioneer, you are a fashion designer, you're a textile designer, you're a founder of a museum, you've had a cameo in a film, which is my favourite fact about you, you've designed <laughs> sets, you are just the most phenomenal woman, it is my absolute privilege to just get to have a natter with you about your adventures. Oh, so well, thank, thank you, you for being here wearing my clothes. I am so excited to be in them and this is my favourite one, but don't tell oh, anyone that. Now, I want to take us back to the very start of your career. I read about the fact that your mother was this exotic, incredible creature, this amazing woman, as you say. And I want to know about that first buzz that you felt for textiles. When was that? Where did that come from? Well, I think it really came when I first went to art college and I thought I'd be a book illustrator. And then there was this amazing teacher, Barbara Brown, who was like, uh, well, a dominatrix, probably. And she sort of, she'd she'd command that what we had to do and she yeah. said if you work really hard I'll get you into the Royal College and you do textiles and so for three years she taught textiles with us and and um, I suppose I at that time I almost idolized her and then I went to the Royal College and started to do textiles and Pucci had just started doing those all those big wonderful Rome um, Italian mm. large-scale things which is a big influence, and I thought, oh, I'm going to do my own version of that. As at the moment in England, they were little baby Liberty Prints. Yeah. And so I, I walked around with pieces of paper around me to see what I looked like in the mirror, and I got them to let me do prints for the Royal College Dress Show. And Grace Codlington was modelling. She was fantastic. I love that. I find it so interesting as well that you say that you went to college and you saw the people on the catwalks and that they weren't dressing people in your prints the way that you wanted and that you tend to create your garments around the prints. But I can imagine in your career you've had to take a lot of leaps and learn a lot of new skills. Where do you think that that kind of bravery came from to take those leaps? I think it was really that when I tried to sell my, my prints, no one would buy them. So I set up my own little print studio so I could print the dresses. And then this wonderful woman, English Vogue, Marit Lieberson, Marit Allen she was then, took them to the English Vogue and they featured them. And then a friend of mine, I met these two mad Ukrainian-American models who were all hippie dancing around the King's Road. And they said, Sandra, you've got to bring your things to America and someone will back you and it will be all wonderful. So for some reason, I only knew one other American and I booked a flight to go to America and I persuaded Vogue to write a letter to Deanna Vreeland, the head of American Vogue, who saw me and she was the most amazing woman. I mean, she talked to you and she was so amazing that you forgot what she was like. And she said, we will photograph these on Natalie Wood. And she photographed them on Natalie Wood and she introduced me to the top um, boutique store in New York, Henry Bendel, wow. and it all went on from there. It's amazing. I love how casually you just got introduced to two heads of Vogue. It just shows again that you are a queen. So you come back from America and you set up your own line for your own clothes, and you do that for many years. And I many read, years, many <laughs> years, and we're still here now. <laughs> Something I really wanted to know, as a, I guess, a young woman just kind of starting out in within the music industry. I read that you do your emails at 6.30 a.m. because you find keeping the books and you know all these other elements just a bit tiresome. I want to know about the disciplines that you had to have in those early days, you know, coming back from being in America with this belief from these, from Vogue and, and other people, and then really having to hustle for yourself and, and as a career woman. Do you have any disciplines that you've had throughout these years that have helped cultivate your creativity? I mean, when I started, I was still teaching two days a week. Mm. So I'd, I'd go to my studio, which was right by Paddington Goods Yard, and I'd go there at five o'clock in the morning and set the work for the machinist to do. Mm. And then I'd go teaching for the day. Mm. And I did that as long as I could bear it, but I didn't like teaching. And it gradually all built up from there, really. Mm. And, um, and on the way, different things happened to me, like, when I had my little studio, Britt Eklund came knocking at the door and she'd only just married Peter Sellers. And I made her the wonderful quilted dress. And then 
David Bailey commissioned me to do a quilted dress for Paloma Picasso. So, you know, it was all little things that gradually built up. And then I was invited to um, Japan, and Issei Miyake saw my things, and he said, I'll organise a show for you. So I did a show in Japan. So it was all sorts of little tiny steps that gradually led to other big steps. Yeah. Have you always had a belief in yourself, Sandra? Because, I mean, meeting you, you are eccentric, you're flamboyant, you're fabulous. And it sounds like, from what you're saying, these different moments keep happening in your life that are profound and amazing, but it takes quite a lot of internal belief to, to pursue that. Well, the belief was, if I didn't do it, what would I do? Mm -hmm. I couldn't... I didn't like teaching. I wanted to do, you know, things that I believed in. And so something in the... always made me do that, and somehow... I was lucky enough that then that someone would come along and believe in that bit, and then someone could come along and believe in another bit, you know. I mean, there was the woman who ran Fortnum, so Anne Knight, said she'd be my partner, and then we, Ronnie Sterling said, I'll back you in a shop for Bond Street. Wow. So it was all little, little things that yeah. led to all those other things. Yeah so much sense and I think also maybe you have a bit of an internal fire anyway which sounds like you get from your mum. And it's very exciting doing a textile design and realising that you can change the look of the fabric and what yeah. you can do with it and how it goes around the body or makes someone feel wonderful whether it's like yours with little stars on mm. it or this one which is seashells. Yeah exactly. You know and just by printing on a plain piece of fabric. Yeah you change it into something else. Yeah, and I really feel that. I think when you put clothes on, they give you another power, don't they? And I can imagine, I mean, I know you've dressed so many iconic people. Tell me about some of your favorite people that you've dressed, maybe artists, people within the music industry. I mean, it was wonderful doing the outfit for Freddie Mercury at the time. I mean, it, it was, I had my little studio on the third floor in Bayswater that you had to walk up all these rickety stairs. Yeah. And I asked them to come in the evening because I didn't have a changing room. Yeah. And and then I, in the end, I took a lovely pleated bridal top off, which was all pleating. And I said, move around the room and see if that's how you want to feel mm. when you're on the stage, mm. you know. Mm. And so that was the outfit that you always remember him in, yeah. rather than the black T-shirt. Yeah, very, very true. <laughs> Did you find that artists and musicians, when you dress them, would take on a bit of a different persona because of their clothes? They might have done. I mean, I never felt that I knew them well enough. Mm. They, I'd make the outfit and I might go to the concert and see them moving in it and feel proud that I'd been involved in it. But I don't think I, I never, never got round to talking to them to say, how do you feel <laughs> afterwards? You what know, because once notion? they're on the stage, yeah. you know, I, yeah didn't see them after that. No, I can imagine. And I think something that really inspires me about you is you speak about being original and regardless of whether, I mean, I have a quote here that you said, which I absolutely love and I, I want to get framed, which is that you said, keep going when you're not flavor of the season and you're not just to, to stop being a one-off shooting star. And I wanted to know, how do you maintain your originality? I mean, looking at these prints that you have done with free people, looking at, I mean, in this incredible um, home of yours, so original, but I know that that is something that you have to keep cultivating. I don't know that I keep cultivating it. I mean, I'm a very boring collector. Like, I'm, I'm weighed down with all these things. I see something in an exhibition, I think, oh, I've got to have that. And I have my lovely impractical... Well, these aren't actually impractical, but I do incredible. have an impractical teapot with three spouts. And when you try pouring it, it doesn't pour evenly and the yeah. middle one runs over. <laughs> so that... But on the other hand, I like to think that I never give up and that I can just... I'll just try things and, and hope that we come up with wonderful ideas that will go mm. on and on and that people will want. Yeah, I really... I, well, I mean, you spun a, beyond a decade and many moons of decades and stars of decades, so I think you keep creating what people want. Oh, it's been so lovely. This... You know, we've come out of COVID mm. and now I have a whole collection I for know. free people. And I want to hear all about it. So you, I'd love to know a bit about your inspiration behind each of the prints and what was the process with free people? Oh, well, free people. We had a meeting and then we put different ideas to them and they happened to choose. They like the stars. Yeah. That's the stars and bows. One of my very earliest designs 
with sort of the magical little pops in the pop star period. And then this one is circular shells. Yeah. And they picked really lovely ones that we just adore and have lived with for a few years and not used. It's wonderful. And I read that you, I mean, I know that you're very inspired by your travel, and I know you spent a lot of time in America. Is there anywhere else that you've been that has, you felt has really inspired your textile design? India is a land of inspiration. Of course, we can't go there at the moment, but there's always something in India that inspires you, whether it's the, as you know, it would be the colour. Mm -hmm. And as Deanna Vreeland would say, pink is the navy blue of India. With pink hair, you can do anything in India. You can go into a, ba a village and all these ladies will come and touch my hair. They won't think, why has this lady got pink hair? It's quite amazing, really. It is incredible. <laughs> and I know that you have, we have this incredible leather jacket that you did. Can you tell me a bit about the print that's on the back of that oh. one? Because I know that oh. that's, that's not Indian inspired, but it's... That's the actual inspiration of the original design is a trip to Mexico with Mexican embroidery and, and all the Mayan brickwork. And the way that jacket's been beaded, well, it's... It's got French knots on it and it's got lovely strips that have been all embroidered over. It's quite magical how it's been interpreted to be like this magical rocker jacket. Mm. Very inspirational. And tell me about how these prints are formed because I know that you often say that you will sit and draw. And is that something that you still do? I try and draw more than, well, in fact, now that I'm surrounded by flowers, I'm going to have to sit and draw <laughs> these flowers. But sometimes by drawing them, you just learn just that bit more. So one of my favourite things about what you design is the frills. I am frill mad. And I'd love you to tell me a little bit about that design but that you've done with three people, about that print. Where did that come from? I like the idea that in print, you can actually print something. So it's not a real frill, it's a print. Right. And the printed frill can then just goes all over the fabric in all sorts of places and it doesn't lose its shape. And it's going to always look, you look gorgeous in that mustardy one. It's such a good one. And it's one of my earliest, and I think I probably did it in those days, in crayon and then filled in. And my, my designs are very scrappy. They always have to be fitted together to look all right. I find that inspiring, though, because I, it's, it's equipping as to that you don't have to be perfect at things to be able to start them, which is inspiring, I think. Yeah. And not, I think the main thing in life with everything is never to give up. Mm. You've always got people to tell you to give up. Don't take any notice, oh, you know. I need you to say that just, again to me. Uh, <laughs> oh my just think, something in me makes me do it, mm. and I've got to do it. And it was the same with the fact that the printed fabric can totally change a, a, a thing that you're wearing mm. and give it a story. Yeah. And a lovely story that means that you've always got something lovely to wear. Yeah. And it covers the fabric. So true. And I know a lot of your stories, story is where a lot of your prints start from. And you've had a lot of time in America. Is there a favourite place for you or a favourite story that you have in America that maybe has inspired a print for you? Well, I think my cowboy cactus ones were inspired by a trip across America, you know, and then drawing the cactuses. Because I always have a sketchbook. So with this one, I like always enjoy just drawing little pop stars, you know, at the time of like the Warhol factory and everything like that mm. and seeing what happened with all those things or with frills you can make the frills do all these marvellous exotic things mm. and they're always going to look lovely on your dress mm. and the fact that you have never run out of ideas is something that I do but I don't tell don't anyone don't tell anyone but I find it so inspiring <laughs> as a songwriter and as an artist I feel like I come up with something I think is great then we capture it and then I'm like I'm over this and I have nothing else then to give. Then you've got to think of the next one. Yeah, exactly. So I think... And you just sit down and get on with the next one. Yeah. I'm going to take Whatever things over. happens. Yeah. I think that's fabulous. I think um, one of my favourite things in kind of preparing for today was just looking at how liberated you are as a woman and you've pioneered in your career as a woman, which I can imagine hasn't always been easy. You are a very free and empowered person. And I'd love to know, for you, what does being free mean? I think being free means that you you don't even have to think if you're a woman or not. You just think, what's valid about the design I'm doing? And is it something that people will want to wear? Mm -hmm. And you have to design something, and then you have to give it colours that people will want to wear. And I try it on the piece of paper, and I look at myself in it, and think what I can do with it. Mm -hmm. And then hope that it's going to be wonderful in all the shops. 
Which it always is. And all these people are going to go along to free people yes. and buy them. Yeah. Oh. So for the free people wearer, if you could give them one top tip on being a bit freer, whether that's in how they dress, whether that's in them being more of themselves, from one eccentric woman to one budding eccentric woman, what would you say? I would think go into there and try on the clothes. Yes. Try them on and see how you feel. And then know that you can do anything with them. You can. I've got a jacket on that will go over anything I have, so it's very easy. You're in that sexy dress, but there are people that could wear it with, I would wear it with a longer top underneath it, because at my age, I wouldn't be showing my arms. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, you can do so many things. And with a print, it doesn't show half of the problems. I love it. <laughs> I am so excited for people to get to wear the prints and the designs. They are absolutely incredible. And the fact that they have come from your heritage designs, I just find so exciting. And Dames Under Rhodes, you are a phenomenal woman. You are a pioneer. You are the embodiment of bravery. And it's been an absolute honor to get to sit with you and just have a little natter. So cheers to you and oh, your new cheers. collaboration with three people. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Thank you. It's actually nice cold. Nice cold. We okay? <laughs>